earlier, Mason came to accident and emergency after injuring his ankle. Let's catch up with him. Back in Sheffield, eight-year-old Mason is in with a badly swollen ankle. Mason was trampolining and jumping as high as he could, but his cousin was on the same trampoline. They smashed into each other, toppled down, and Mason twisted his ankle. Ouch! Dr Beavis has x-rayed Mason's foot and has seen a small fracture. Mason's going to need to have a plaster cast on for a few weeks, so why is he so happy? Got what I wanted, crutches. But before he can get them, he needs to prove he can use them. First, he needs to get his plaster cast on. I'm never going on a trampoline ever again. Really, Mason? Can't imagine why. Ooh, that's nice. Ooh, I think he's enjoying this, Chris. Oh, I can feel it setting already. All done. Mason's quite young for crutches, hence the test. Are you getting me crutches now? Yeah, but it all depends on if you can work them. Because she says you're a bit little, but because she's so tall, they're going to try. There, my crutches. The moment of truth has arrived. It certainly has, Zand. Oh, hey. Mason needs to show the nurse that he can get about on the crutches without falling over. Let's do it. He's styling it. Success. Yeah. So, armed with his new crutches, Mason speeds off, ready to impress the girls. Was there ever any doubt in your mind? A little wobble, but not major. And what has he learned? Don't never try and do as I as you can on a trampoline, because that's what happens. Careful, Mason. A bit stumbly, but off we go. Bye. Your body can need mending in all sorts of ways, and we're going to meet some special teams that are trained to fix you. <laughs> Speaking is one of the most complicated things you can do. And while I bet you know that your lips and tongue and voice box are all involved, I bet you don't know what your soft palate does or even where it is. Well, open your mouth and say ah. Uh... See that? It's where the dangly bit hangs from. And most of us use it without even thinking about it. But today, we're going to meet a patient who's learning to use hers. Nine-year-old Millie is in speech therapy after she was born with a cleft palate. This means she had a hole going through the roof of her mouth to her nose. She's had a series of operations to fix this. However, Millie still finds speaking a little bit difficult. There are some sounds that you find really easy and some sounds that you find difficult. And I find the S word more difficult than other words. And that's, that's the one you've been working on today, isn't it? Yeah. When you make a speech sound like an S, the soft palate needs to lift up and make a seal with the back of the throat. In Millie's case, she isn't able to do that. So when air comes up, it isn't directed just into her mouth, it also escapes down her nose as well. To help her with that, she's working with speech therapist Jane O'Connell. Today I've joined the class and Jane's set us a challenge. I've got to make up a sentence for each of these words. I bet I'll be better than you. <laughs> like you, powerful, I get. Well. Oh, you might use powerful adjectives? Yeah. I don't think I know any powerful adjectives. <laughs> so. My dad showed um, the word to make a door. My dad sawed the word to make a door. Good sentence. Now it's my turn. Uh, I saw the sun shining in the sky. No, what I saw. What is Showing. Millie's having none of it. So I can't say I saw the sun. No. No, I meant like I saw the sun. No, that doesn't work. Does it? Well, you tried. I think I need my homework more than Millie. <laughs> <laughs> there are other sounds that most of us take for granted, but again, our bodies have to do more than you'd think. Make a mmm sound for me. Mmm. OK, what happens if I hold your nose? Listen to what happens to mm. that sound. Mm. Oh, I can't. I can't do it. No. What would normally happen is the air would come down your nose, but because I'm holding your nose, I'm blocking the air from coming down, and it actually turns that sound into almost a b sound. So try that at home. Make a m mm sound, and the m mm sound is a nasal sound where the air does have to come out your nose, and if you block your nose, mm. Mm. you can't make the sound, so it becomes a b. 
as the air escapes. So the really difficult thing that Millie's having to learn is to consciously control muscles that most people don't even know exist, like the muscles at the top and the back of your mouth. And so that is quite a skill to master. Before we finish, Millie's got her own speaking challenge for me. OK, so I've got to say red lorry and yellow lorry. That's fast. Fast. <laughs> red lorry, yellow lorry. Red lorry, yellow lorry. Red... Oh, I can't do it. <laughs> oh, she beat me again. Good luck, Millie. All over the UK, there are emergency teams standing by, ready to help you. And they need to get to the scene of an accident fast. We're on call with the UK Emergency Services, showing you what it's really like on the front line saving lives. This is a rapid response vehicle. It's on standby 24-7 to respond to whatever emergency calls come in. Today, I'm going along for the ride and you're coming with me. On call with me is paramedic Jan Van. She can do 20 emergency call-outs in a day. And a new case is just in. We're going to see someone who's got a very severe cut on the head and they're refusing to go to hospital. Now, the reason we don't have the sirens on or the blue lights on is because they're with an ambulance crew at the moment. But Jan is the only person on call at the moment who can glue his head together, which is what we're going to try and do. At the house, the man, Paul, is in good spirits despite the nasty gash to his head. Thanks for coming out. It's short nice. It's all right. As a paramedic with 10 years' experience, Jan has the expert training needed to use special glue to join Paul's wound together. Right, this glue might sting a little bit, OK? How's that feel, Paul? Can't feel anything. Not stinging. Good. The super glue that Jan's using now will hold that wound closed. It doesn't need stitches, and it stops the bleeding. It'll stop infection getting in, and it gives a, it gives a nice result. It gives a tidy scar. All large head wounds should be seen at a hospital, but Paul has refused to go, so Jan gives him some advice. Any headaches that aren't controlled with painkillers will need to be assessed at the hospital. Okay. Vomiting more than twice will need to be assessed at the hospital. Yeah. We have got a slight issue. Well. My fingers are stuck to your head. <laughs> uh, not really. <laughs> Jan has done all she can for Paul, and it's up to him now to be vigilant and spot any side effects. See you then. Take care, see you later. Bye. Bye. See ya. So even though Paul didn't want to go to hospital, we were still able to glue his head together. That stopped the bleeding, it reduces pain, it reduces the chances of infection, and we've given him some really clear advice about what to do if he gets worse and he does need to go to hospital. And that's all thanks to Jan. With hundreds of rapid response crews in the UK, if you have an accident, an emergency service like this won't be far away. I'm ready! Ready for what? To come to work with you today. Look, I've got everything I need. I've got Mr Grumbles. Obviously, he wanted to come too. I've got a new pencil case, in case we have to go to any meetings. I've got some snacks, cheese straws, Mr Grumbles' favourite. Zan, Zan, you and Mr Grumbles are not coming to work with me today. What? What are we going to do then? You're going to go to your work. Ah, I'm late! Well, Mr Grumbles and Zan may not be coming with me to work today, but you are. Time for investigation, ouch. I'm wearing a special suit, but can you guess what it's used for? Oh, I know! You're going into space! Uh, nope, try again, Zand. OK, I've got it. You're about to drive a Formula One car. Uh, no, Zand, wrong again. How's he doing that with the music? Anyway, Zand is wrong. This is PPE, or Personal Protective Equipment. It's used so that doctors and nurses can treat patients with serious infections without getting ill themselves. Um, I knew that, really. Now, you might have seen suits like this on the news because of the recent outbreak of a very serious virus called Ebola in West Africa. Now, these things make the news because they're rare, but they're also very serious. So, what can we do to stop them in their tracks? Well, it's something I'm closely involved in. So this is the lab that I work in when I'm not on Operation Out. Ooh, I've always wanted to see Chris's lab. This is my boss, Greg. Hi, Greg. Hi, Chris. Who's that? That is Operation Out. Hi, Operation Out. Oh, hi, Greg. Come on, Chris, you've got work to do. 
Now, I study a virus called HIV, but scientists like me study all viruses using really similar techniques to work out how to treat and prevent diseases. And I'm about to show you how we do it. An infectious disease like a virus is similar to a burglar who's found exactly the right spanner to break into your cell's security system and infect them. Scientists like me Oi. want to find out which part of the virus spanner unlocks the cell. Then we can stop the spanner working and create medicine to make people better. To show you how we do it, I've created my own infectious disease demonstration. I'm going to start with a real virus, but there's something else. Now, to understand how viruses work, we need to make mutants. To make a mutant, I take my original virus and change one thing about it by changing the shape of the spanner. Today, I'm making two different mutants, mutant 1 and mutant 2. They're both the same as the original virus. Except I've made a different change in each one in their spanner to see if that change stops that spanner working. I then add each of these samples to healthy human cells to see which one is able to infect them. OK, so now the moment of truth. First, I'm going to show you what uninfected cells look like. So these are healthy cells with no virus on them. They're nice and stuck down to the plate, and there are lots and lots of them. Now cells that have been infected with the original virus. And can you see, all the cells are clumped up and they're floating around, there are a few of them. Then I turn on a special light and the cells glow green, which tells me they've been infected by the virus. So we know this virus is working really well. It has exactly the right spanner to get inside these cells and infect them and make them sick. Time to see what's happened with Mutant 1. Can you see that? The cells are floating around and, just like the original virus, they're all green. So this mutant, the first mutant, still has a working spanner. It can get inside those cells and infect them and make them sick. Now let's check Mutant 2. They look really healthy and there are lots and lots of them. And when we put on the special light, none of these cells are green. So the spanner of Mutant number 2 virus is no longer working. It's not able to get inside the cells, infect them, turn them green and make them go sick. So that's great. We've now discovered which bit of the spanner is the important bit for getting inside cells. Curing a disease doesn't just happen in a day. I've given you a demonstration of how we go about it, but sometimes it takes a long time to find the right mutation. And there are lots of diseases that we still don't understand how they infect human cells. We don't understand how their spanners work, if you like. But research like this has led to some major breakthroughs that saved a lot of lives. So, now you know what fantastic work Chris does when he's not on Operation Ouch. Good work. Ouch. Today, I've come to Broomfield Hospital in Essex to meet some of the patients getting help with their burns. Today's first patient is 11-year-old Maria. Can you tell me what happened? Well, basically, when I fell asleep and I had my iPad on my leg, so and I fell asleep on it. You had your iPad on your leg? Yeah, and I fell asleep on it. So you had it plugged in and it was getting hot because it was charging? Yeah, That's but I didn't realise it. Maria has a condition that reduces sensation in her legs. That's why she didn't feel being burnt. That was three months ago and she's still being treated. Today she's seeing specialist burns nurse Susan Bozeman. Okay, Maria, I'm just going to take your dressing off, darling, all right? It was a deep burn, so Maria needed special treatment. Look away now if you're squeamish. So Maria's had a skin graft operation done. So just a very thin layer of skin was just shaved off from here. And then that was put over here where the hole was and stitched round in place, wasn't it, round there? And why do you need to do the skin graft? Why can't you just let it heal the way that you might let any other cut heal? Small burns can heal up quite nicely on their own, but when you've got a bigger and deeper burn like this, you need to give nature a little bit of help, because otherwise it's very sore and it's more likely to get an infection in it and it will take a very long time to heal over. Over time, that will go back completely to normal, will it? It will, it will flatten out a bit more, yeah. um, but there will probably always be a little mark. We won't need to put any more dressings on it now because there's no raw skin, so no more dressings. Is that, is that really good news? <laughs> yeah. The next patient is Troy. He burnt his hand three years ago. So tell me what happened when you got your burn. I was on the roof helping my dad clean the gutter. There was a cable right here. Um, but um, I thought um, it was a, a railing, so um, I put my hand on it and then uh, I blacked out. And what's the next thing you remember? Well, I remember waking up and then I looked at my hands like... 
And what had happened to your hand? Well, um, well, first, uh, my little finger, it isn't there now, um, but, um, but it was actually welded onto this bit here. The electric burn from the live cable was so severe that Troy's little finger had to be removed. He's also had skin grafts from his leg and his foot. How many operations have you had? Uh, Twelve. Twelve operations? Yeah. Does your left hand still do everything you need it to do? Uh, yeah. Um, well, it still plays video games, so that's all I really need it to do. <laughs> that's a relief. Today, Troy's seeing burns therapist Vicky Dudman. So, Troy, how have you been? Oh, I've been OK. Have a look. So any problems? Um, nothing much. Really, at this stage of the treatment, it's just about keeping on with the moisturising and massage. So what's the massage doing when...? It helps to break up the scar tissue and soften it up. This is something Troy will need to keep doing at home himself. So, Troy, from your experience, what advice would you have for the people watching Operation Ouch? That they should be really, really careful around electricity because it's um, very dangerous. Good advice from Troy, who continues well with his recovery. Serious burns can be really scary, and Troy and Maria have done a brilliant job dealing with their burns. And that's what's amazing. Your body has an incredible ability to heal itself with the right help. Ouch. Time to head back to Accident and Emergency to catch up with Jack and his sausage finger. Oh, I love sausages. Do you think he's got any ketchup? Let's see him get fixed. In Manchester, nine-year-old Jack is back in hospital waiting for an operation, and he's brought along a new friend. Now I don't have a sausage finger, I have Cyril. Hello, Cyril. Cyril is protecting Jack's cut finger, and this is how it was damaged. It was Jack's birthday, and he'd been given some money to buy a gift at the toy shop. When they arrived, Jack got out of the car, and in the excitement, he closed the car door on his finger. Ouch! Jack's operation is just moments away, so Cyril's days are numbered. Tell him, Dad. You're going to lose Cyril, aren't you? Never mind, Jack. Jack's on his way to have his operation. And there's no sign of nerves from our patient. In fact, he's cracking jokes. Not not. Who's there? Done a poo. Done a poo. <laughs> Get it? I think Cyril enjoyed that one, too. Time to prepare Jack for theatre. To make sure he doesn't feel any of the procedure, the doctor gives him some anaesthetic. Dr Anne Markey and Dr Adiyinka Malajo are performing Jack's surgery. First, they thoroughly clean Jack's hand. The next step is to remove the nail so they can stitch up the finger. And remember, Jack can't feel a thing. Before he can start to stitch, Dr. Adeyinka takes out any little bits of dirt and broken nail stuck in the wound. Next, he stitches the cut before gluing back on the nail. And there's just enough time for a quick trim. With the nail in place, a protective gauze is put around the tip of Jack's finger to stop the bandage sticking to the wound. Time to wrap that sausage finger back up. Good. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. How was the op, Doc? That went really well. He's got another sausage finger for a couple of weeks till that gets better. On the recovery ward, Jack's wide awake. So, how was your snooze? I had like this dream when I, when I was in an action figure movie. An action figure movie? Cool. But are you missing Cyril? Since Cyril's gone, I have a new sausage finger. He's forgotten Cyril already. I know. And it looks like he's about to take that sausage finger home. Bye, Jack. Bye.